when I move my body, it's not just for the exercise or for the performance. It's mm -hmm. actually in some ways, it's where my uh, emotional body gets to express. So discharge energy. I get to express all the negative energy inside of me as well as the positive energy inside of me. And it's that movement that keeps me feeling free inside, like uncluttered, unstuck. Um, not that that lasts forever. There's, then there's other things that come in and get stuck in my body. So the constant mm -hmm. practice of moving it out. Hey guys, my name is Katie Enterkin and I'm on a mission to help humans become the best possible versions of themselves and to unveil what I like to call the beautiful beast that already lives inside us all. And welcome to the podcast about everything and a little bit of nothing. I've had the privilege to talk to all kinds of different humans who have been through a plethora, oh, I love that word, a myriad of experiences just being a human and existing. These are real conversations with real people, getting to know each other, sharing stories that make us cry, and occasionally pee our pants with laughter. We talk about all kinds of life stuff, parenthood, business, life goals, fitness, chasing your dreams, and yes, even some animal noises are involved. For more information, keep listening. This is the Unveiling the Beast podcast. Hello! Welcome back to the Unveiling the Beast podcast. Maybe it's just me, but I'm just so freaking excited about the diversity of humans I've talked to so far. And that's really the whole freaking point. We're all different and we come from all different walks of life. And I just think it's awesome when people can share their story and touch the life of somebody else who might need their wisdom in the moment. <sighs> okay, I know. I got all mushy for a second. So let me tell you about Elena, a.k.a. Coach Elaine. We met in the community of life coaches from the Elite Coaching University. And we hit it off because we're both passionate about combining life coaching and personal training into like this mesh ball of amazingness. So in this conversation, first of all, we danced like dolphins. That's probably the most important thing. Secondly, we took a deep dive into the coaching and fitness world. And of course, we laughed a lot. Before we get started, I want you to ask yourself this question. How old is your soul? As always, I hope something lands with you today. I hope something you hear tugs on your heartstrings and or I hope you laugh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I am with... What about the non-binary folks? What about the people who are gender non-conforming? Are we welcoming them too? Yeah. Okay. Fine. Ladies and gentlemen in all genders, yeah. welcome back to the Unveiling the Beast podcast. I'm with my home slice, Elena, Coach Elena. And um, so, um, Elena, why don't you tell my listener a little, your a little listener. bit about yourself? Yeah. Your, what, your one listener? Yeah, my mom. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a conversation for your mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's Beautiful. gonna get to know all my friends. What are what is your mom interested in knowing? Or what kinds of conversations are you having for your mom? Well, can you tell us a little bit about um where you grew up? Oh. To get the ball rolling? Rolling that Sure. Ball? I mean technically I haven't grown up yet. I'm still growing there up. There you go. Okay, the standard answer. Or maybe I should, maybe I could rephrase it and say, can you tell our listeners how you grew up? Ooh, that's a question nobody's ever asked. Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> well, <laughs> how? I think a little bit more. Mm -hmm. How I grew up. I grew up in the tropical heat and beauty of the beaches in Venezuela and the valley um, that is known as the city of Caracas. I grew up learning Spanish as my first language. I grew up with a father who spoke English and 
speaking both languages and trying to figure that out. And I grew up with another sibling um, older than me and two younger than me as a middle child. And I grew up in the water as a swimmer. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought I wanted to be a dolphin when I grew up. What was that dancer? I still want to be a <laughs> dolphin when I grow up. Yep, that is our, that's our dolphin dance. You got to be a dolphin. Uh, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are thrusting our chest forwards and backwards. <laughs> and dolphin. flailing our arms in the air. Yeah, that's how I grew up. Pretty much like that. Nice. Um, so right now you're in the fitness industry, correct? I am. Nice. How did you How did you get into that? I thought that wearing sweats would be a pretty cool professional career. Everyone else had to put on suits and ties, and I was like, "What? I can wear shorts and sweats and a t-shirt and get paid? I don't want that profession." I know it nice. sounds a little like cheesy, but I remember a point in time where I graduated from <clears throat> getting my master's degree and, you know, it's time to go get that job and work in the, in the desk job or whatever it was. And I thought, you know what? No, my heart is where my t-shirts are. My heart is where <laughs> my tennis shoes are. My heart is where uh, my body gets to move and that's where my heart is happy. And so I went into um, really committed into the fitness industry. So that's, that was your reason for starting. So you could go to work in sweats, but what's been your reason for staying and continuing staying. what you do? Well, I mean, just to carry forward that my heart is where my tennis shoes are and my heart is where moving is. I love moving. I love the physical body as a tool, meaning when I move my body, it's not just for the exercise or for the performance. It's mm -hmm. actually in some ways, it's where my uh, emotional body gets to express. So discharge energy. I get to express all the negative energy inside of me as well as the positive energy inside of me. And it's that movement that keeps me feeling free inside, like uncluttered, unstuck. Um, not that that lasts forever. There's, then there's other things that come in and get stuck in my body. So the constant mm -hmm. practice of moving it out. And for me, fitness is not just a professional career and helping other people move their body, but it's a personal practice of uh, what my partner coined the term in like liberating the body or a liberatory practice for the body. I find that exercising, just moving, stretching, what you're told to do in fitness um, generally, flexibility, mobility, strength, and power mm -hmm. for me is also a, it's like an art for me to bring those other aspects of myself. My thoughts get to clear, um, my emotional body gets to express itself, and my physical body gets stronger. Um, so that's what keeps me, because as long as I have a physical body, at least in my, my experience of myself, I am going to have those emotions that come and sometimes mm -hmm. get stuck there. I'm going to have the thoughts that lead to some of the emotions in my body. And I'm going to have to, like you said, do that dolphin dance. I'm going to have to <laughs> shake it off. And yeah, and the fitness industry, the reason it kind of keeps me there as a collective body the other people in the fitness industry, they're all learning, um, advancing their knowledge around how to work with the body at so many different levels that it keeps mm -hmm. it exciting for me. It keeps it interesting. Yeah. And that's what I love about it. That's awesome. The one thing I love about you is that there's so many people out there that think of exercising as just to look a certain way. And that's to it's not about the six pack for me. It's not about, it's not even about losing weight anymore for me anyway, but so many people are so focused on, I'm working out to burn this amount of calories and to weigh this much on the scale. And you're just like, no, this is for me to take in the good and push out the bad, 
with the mm-hmm. pushing, pulling movements. So I just, I love that about you. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> I'll receive that compliment and just feel all the feels. I got goosebumps right now. If, the, if your mom could see, I think she would find this fascinating. Maybe I'll, sh- I'll screenshot this part of the video yeah, for yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. There, goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's my no, body. But really, like, like in, your, in, in your whole explanation of the reason why you say, not once did you mention that it's to help people look a certain way. It's just to help people with their minds, which is, I think, why you and I get along so well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now I'm blushing. I uh-huh. love it when there's, I love it when there's a connection. Um, yeah, that is, um, you know, to me, it kind of feels like we're rooting for the underdog. And I think in fitness, um, the emotional body is the underdog. Mm-hmm. And when we help people feel good like discharging that negative energy and bringing in positive energy and doing it through physical movements whereas what Mm -hmm. we're doing with the client might not look any different than a trainer who's helping somebody else quote look good on the outside it might not look different but because we have these conversations as you know in your neurotransformational coaching work we have these conversations with our clients and then when we go and actually perform it the intentionality mm-hmm. of what they bring into that exercise, to me, it feels like the most beautiful experience of the art and the science all blended together. And I think that was lacking most of the time. We just focus on the looks. And so rooting for the underdog, bringing the emotional body back into it, uh, for me, just it's, it's an element, I think, that adds beauty. And that beauty is not what other people call a six pack or call a six size six dress or whatever, you know, the external form of beauty is. But I think it's beautiful when people are not weighed down by their anxiety, by their fear, by their um, resistance to feel their body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're expressive and they own their unique expression of their energy and they can channel that it's as if they're representing power not as if they are they're representing their own power they're saying like this is who i am this is how i am and they're using their personal power and man it really does on the other side of that it really does look good when you see somebody whether they're pushing their own body weight or they're uh, pulling a certain amount of resistance, but they're doing it with that intentionality. Mm -hmm. They're doing it by like trying to move energy. I've seen people do more reps than they ever thought they could lift um, more weight than they thought they could, because when you get out of the thought energy and Mm -hmm. you move into the emotional energy, there's more power there. It really is. Yeah. 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 And you also have, I know you mentioned this before, but you also have that aspect of um, the neurotransformational coaching. Um, Yeah. Thanks for our listener. We have this. Yeah. We have the same. um, I guess I would say, I don't want to say we have the same education because I don't think that's true, but as far as the, the programs that we've been in, I don't even know what I'm trying to say, <laughs> but like we both have, we have that, shared a journey that, together. Yeah. We have that neurotransformational coaching training and I don't even know, it doesn't matter where you got your training for personal training, but it's the same um, idea that we have mm-hmm. to blend the two together and make it just not even about, again, the way you look, but how, how the way you, how the way you feel. <laughs> It is about how it's the way, how the way you, you feel. feel. I love it. <laughs> it's about how the way you feel. <laughs> That's a song. And a dance. <laughs> and a dance. Yeah. That's right. So, hi. What's your name? Hi. My name is Katie. And I'm 34 and a half tomorrow. What's the date tomorrow? Just December. kidding. I'm 34 and a half on the night. What do you mean for 34 and a half? I'm 34 years and six months. Is that how tall you are? 
Oh, 34 years and six months. Young? Yeah. Yeah. You are young. Do you know how old your soul is? My soul is probably 87 years old. Human Wait, years? What? Yeah. Okay, maybe 50. How about you? How old is your soul? Ooh, my soul, I think, is 400 years old. Oh, I like it. I thought I was getting up there in age, but you're in, such in, a in, baby. in the wisdom sense, in the wisdom sense. Not yeah, like, no, oh, baby. I mean, you're getting old. <laughs> <sighs> I just wish I had known all that wisdom coming into this incarnation. It really yeah. sucks that like you can have a soul that's older than a lifetime, yet the wisdom you come into this world with is what? Like you start out as a baby, not knowing yeah. anything. A blank slate. Yeah, that's cruel. Cause like, what if you knew? Okay, so you're 86. Your soul is 86. Mm -hmm. What if you had all of that wisdom that an 86-year-old had right now at 34? How would that change your experience? Wouldn't the experience give me that 86-year-old wisdom anyway? Well, can you tap into it? My experience? I think uh -huh. I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> we lost. Mayday. Mayday, we've lost her. Bring her back. She got lost between 86 and 34. Yeah. So you're saying, are you saying when I'm 86? No, if, if I you have... could tap into the wisdom of your soul's age. Like you said, your soul's 86, right? Uh-huh. So what if you could tap into the wisdom that your soul has for living 86 years? I gotcha. I gotcha. I think I would make better decisions for sure because, you know, you – there's so many things that we can look back on our lives and be like, oh, if I could tell myself then what I know now. But then if you did tell yourself back then what you know now, you wouldn't have gained the wisdom in the first place. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's like you have to learn the lesson. Yeah. Mm. So it's like, would I still have married my abusive ex-husband? Probably. This is going into what a the thing to laugh at. <laughs> I can laugh now. Oh, I wish this had bodies. Oh my god! <laughs> I can just see. I don't know where we're going with this, but like. <laughs> Yeah, there would be a lot more laughter. There'd be a lot more laughter. It'd be like, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. Well, that actually brings me to a question I asked one of my other people is, if, there, if you could tell your 18-year-old self something, just anything, whether it's a nugget of wisdom or just like, make sure your shoe is tied, <laughs> like, what would you say to her? My 18-year-old self, Ooh, that's such a good question because at 19, I had my first back injury, which kind of blew my dream of, of um, playing professional basketball and being a professional athlete. So if I could go back to before that dream-crushing injury and say something to my 18-year-old self, I would tell her, one – get therapy and talk about your emotional stress because I think the reason on top of the physical stressors that my back blew out at 19 was because there was a lot of mental and emotional repressed energy. Mm -hmm. um, and if I had a therapist to talk to, or if I had a way to talk about how my emotional body was feeling left behind I think that that would have supported energetically at least it would have supported more harmony in my body but yeah that was um definitely a critical year from 18 to 19 so I would tell her get therapy get a mm. therapist where you can express your emotional body for sure nice can you, you? Uh, can oh <laughs> 
um stops caring so much about what other people think for sure yeah I mean we could have like hours of a conversation with that one but uh there just came a point where I was just like fuck it (laughs) I don't care I'm goofy I'm weird I'm awkward that's who I am I don't care if you like it or not so uh but yeah there was a lot of stress especially around the weight because I I've been weight cycling my whole life up and down and up and down and up and down and kids are just mean (laughs) you know so I think I was I was bullied hardcore but if I knew not to care so much then it wouldn't it just wouldn't have even phased me you know Mm -hmm. So, yeah, don't give a beep what other people think about you because it doesn't matter after you graduate high school. None of that's going to matter. Yeah, I feel complete. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh, so I was going to ask you, um, could you dissect your back injury for us? Like, tell us a little more about that or my listener. You tell, tell, tell you and me. <laughs> tell me and my mom. Yeah, this, this was a doozy. So, well, at 18, let's go back there. Just bring it back to before it started. I um, was really excited to choose a sport that I knew I could improve. Um, I had, you know, desire to improve to achieve even higher levels of talent so basketball was the choice I made I was good enough to play division two and it also required me to for the first time in my life do the conditioning for one sport Mm -hmm. whereas before I was swimming I was running track or I was playing volleyball and I was doing a bunch of different sports this was the first time where basketball was going to take up all my time and energy So I think that my back started receiving stress from like the same kinds of movement patterns, Mm -hmm. jumping, pounding, that it wasn't used to. And I wasn't used to it either because most of my life was a variety of things. And nobody could see from the outside that I was about to get injured. I didn't even know I was about to get injured. There was nothing visible. And so one day I was reaching down to shave my legs in the shower and I fell to the floor. That was my back injury. It was in the shower shaking my legs. And of course, it's a mystery for why that would happen in the shower. Um, mm-hmm. But what I learned looking back is that the forward flexion, bending over, and that kind of bend on my spine mm-hmm. is what caused the, the succession of compression on my spine, like the series... Mm of repetitive movements that were compressing my spine from jumping and all the lifting. I basically just, those were starting to create wear and tear in my spine, but nobody could see it. And I wasn't clearly symptomatic enough for people to um, evaluate any pain. So as I bent over in the shower, I opened up a couple vertebrae enough where the disc gel of my spine went into the spinal canal area and it radiated Mm. pain all the way down my legs and I couldn't, I couldn't walk. So that's how it happened. But I think even more interestingly is that nobody knew that it was coming, not even myself. And therefore the way they treated it was just to band-aid the pain. They couldn't mm-hmm. really tell me how it happened or how to prevent it further from happening. So for the next four years, I was committed to a scholarship and I had tough, I guess, tough, nerves and I tolerated a lot of pain and then um, I played through whatever I could Um, and after college I went on a journey to figure out what happened how did I hurt myself because I was clearly still in pain I was just Mm -hmm. numbing out I was just covering it up with treatment and then uh, so that's how I originally hurt myself yeah Mm. kind of a mystery thing but looking back now I can reflect on yeah nobody really assessing my body as I condition harder, you know, as I train Mm -hmm. harder and then missing the damage that was happening from repetitive stress. 
And I know I, th- I don't think I'm the only athlete out there that that's ever happened to. I just think it really goes under communicated. Mm-hmm. Because what I've heard from my coaches is like, that just happens. That just happens. And athletes have surgery or it happens and you just deal with it. And I think that's really problematic when stuff like that is happening and people, their response is, oh, that's just what you do. You just have surgery or you just deal with it. Like it's a <laughs> consequence. Like it's of, a small thing. Yeah. 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 Huh. So that really became like researching how and why did this happen became my focus for 10 years actually since wow. the original injury to try to figure out how to prevent it. How did it happen? Because I didn't believe it was a like normal. Let's not just shove this under the rug and. Mm-hmm. And like, oh, it just happens and people just deal with it. No, let's prevent it. Yeah. Yeah. But look at you. One. You're still yeah. athletic because you didn't give up. It's amazing. Well, yeah, that's my journey. I feel like um, I couldn't give up on something so deep inside of me that was begging me to know the answer to. Yeah. So have, have you since? been able to work with the client in a similar situation but both physically and psychologically (laughs) it is kind of like that ladies and gentlemen when I try to use a big word (laughs) that's a great new word psycha caca (laughs) that's actually brilliant oh my goodness so let me say that again So have you been able to work with a client who has had the same issue, but work with them both physically and psycho caca? <laughs> <laughs> I, they know what I mean. <laughs> I, oh yeah, I know. There's a lot of psycho caca out there. I've definitely worked with a lot of bodies that have psycho caca. <laughs> now, I actually have never met someone that has said to me, I hurt my back bending over to shave my legs. Have I worked with people that have herniated discs and bulging discs and um, other spinal pathologies that I have had? Yes. But in the way that they actually um, got that injury or remember the first time that that injury had them, Mm -hmm. it is a variety of things, you know, from like, bending over to put something in the car in the trunk of a car to um, sitting and driving for long periods of time and then getting up out of the car and, you know, having a back injury. So yeah, the, um, the physical, the way in which the physical pain arrives is different. And what is very fascinating is the psychokaka though is very <laughs> similar. The psychokaka is very similar. <laughs> like, <laughs> For example, if you break the psychokaka down, uh-huh. it breaks down into psych, psyche, and kaka, which is psyche shit, right? Psyche shit, yeah. We all have shit in our psyche <laughs> that's weighing us down, that's, um, you know, perhaps uh, impinging on our healthy and harmonious relationship with our body yeah and when we're in pain especially athletes or type a personalities high achievers that are doing a lot in the world with their body they expect a lot from their body they expect their body to be up in the morning get up and go work 10 15 hours a day sleep four hours like it's this expectation of the body and when the body is hurting and they cannot perform because their body is begging them to rest, then yeah. they start really pouring on the psychokaka. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm a piece yeah. of shit. I'm a lazy exactly. piece of shit if I can't work 15 hours a day. Or yeah, uh, I should be I? able to do this. Yeah. Yeah. We're shooting, shooting on ourselves. That's psychokaka. Exactly. That's the um, conscious incompetence. No. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're talking about the stages of awareness that, that people have about yeah. how they're being, right? Yeah. 
Like, and yes, a little different. You okay. can be, I, you're, you're, um, I think you said consciously incompetent, right? Yeah. Which is kind of like consciously incontinent. Yeah. Because you're aware that your body is not functioning properly, but you don't have the skills or you're not actually choosing. You're not making choices to do something different. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, I'm aware that I just said that mean thing to myself and I'm just going to keep eating, beating myself up like cockily and I'm going <laughs> to eat, and I'm going to eat the pint of ice cream. Um, yeah. So there are people that know what they're doing as far as self-harm and they continue doing it. And there's people that don't know, actually, these psychokaka can live in your unconscious. It can live <laughs> below the iceberg. <laughs> The psychokaka can be hidden. <laughs> you might not even know it's there. You can't even uh, smell the stink sometimes. It's yeah, sneaky like that. Some Other people, toilet paper yeah. for our brains. <laughs> oh, I think we need more than toilet paper. Yeah, we need a uh, what's it called a a, a bidet a, a bidet. <laughs> <laughs> This is this is a conversation about fitness, right? This yeah, is, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally 100% in line. Oh, for sure. <clears throat> so I want to ask you, have you ever been coaching a client, whether it's just the, the neurotransformation or um, personal training, where you were actually the one that had the breakthrough? No. No? All the time. All the time. Really? All the time. All the time. All the time. He's like, no, never. Just never. kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's such a great question. And I feel like every single time I'm coaching someone or training them, I am having breakthroughs all the time. Because everyone, and I didn't always know this, it was at some point when I really, really accepted that other people are a mirror for me mm -hmm. and that there really is nothing outside of my projections that if everyone is a mirror for me, then what I'm seeing in them is what I must connect with inside of me or what I'm choosing not to see is also what I'm choosing not to see about myself. So when that landed um, yesterday, um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday <laughs> when that landed yesterday and I had my session today it really yeah, was a breakthrough no um I don't know how long it's been several years now and every single person presents that thing that is inside of me that either I haven't uh, acknowledged or connected with and it's definitely out there it's it's in that other person and every time I train somebody who I get to quote help because mm -hmm. I've overcome injury or I've learned how to self-manage better I remember that part of me that was stuck with their mentality with their yeah. psychokaka and I was like I just want to push my body just give me the workout I just want to be like you know beat up and whatever and when they come to me like that I go, oh, yeah, I remember me when I was like that. Mm. And even if it's not like an aha, amazing breakthrough that I have complete new insight, it is always a kind of a breakthrough, even in remembering the past of where I've been, where I've come from. Um, that's not a breakthrough. That's a break back. Break back, breakthrough. Yeah. But they're, they're somewhat similar. Um, in that instead of feeling like I have power over anybody or feeling like I have authority or I'm any way better than, these moments remind me that they are doing the best they can. I was doing the best I knew at the time as well. And it yeah. allows us to both share an energetic space of empathy and compassion rather than, um, you know, power, control, or 
authority or, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I remember when I was like that. And then I bring that energy of empathy and compassion as well as the guide as far Mm -hmm. as, okay, well, we're going to do this smart, but I do it not from a place of I'm the teacher. I'm the one to tell you what to do. Yeah. It's more like, hey man, I've been there. I know exactly what that feels like. And would you like to hear my suggestion? (laughs) And I actually (laughs) ask ask them for permission to share them, like how I knew I was in their shoes. And I don't know, nine out of 10 times or 10 out of 10 times, they're like, sure, yeah, tell me what what you think. And then that's where it gets to be the, the, the breakthrough and the breakthrough is almost like a relational breakthrough mm-hmm. of like, we're the same here. Yeah. You, know, you might think that I'm the expert, but really my expertise only came from being where you are and exploring why is this happening and how can I better manage this? And so if, if I just tell them what to do, they'll never learn that for themselves. Yeah. But if I share with them, oh, I've been there. And do you want to know what I did when I was in your shoes? Because I was kind of curious. Is like, if I keep doing this and I keep hurting myself, then there must be something that I, you know, can do differently. Yeah. And um, they're like, yeah. And then they are open to receive. Mm-hmm. And from that receptivity, then they are at choice. They get to choose what they're going to do with that. So, so that's where uh, my breakthroughs come all the time is just in remembering. I'm no different than whoever I'm working with. I've either been there, been in their shoes or they're actually reflecting a part of me that I just haven't looked at yet. And I need to, to nurture. Mm, Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, I had this visual when you said, do you go back and remember, this is me. Like, I just had this visual of you. <laughs> it's going to sound so corny. <laughs> it's not funny. I had this visual of you saying, oh, this, this is me. And like grabbing your younger self and hugging her. <laughs> oh, I don't know why that made me laugh, but <laughs> I have a, yeah, I have a wild imagination. I'm corny. Oh and no, honey, cheesy. that's that's Cheese beautiful. And corn served up in this bitch. <laughs> Cheesy corn. Yeah, exactly. And uh, frankly, I mean, what what if, right? What if um, rather than seeing our clients as um, anyone that is outside of ourselves, what if we did see them as parts of ourselves that we just do need to reclaim in that hug Mm. that's a beautiful (laughs) that's a beautiful opportunity yeah yeah or maybe we could even add that to the what would you tell your 18 year old self but just i'd give her a hug (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. it's a very interesting life isn't it yeah getting deep here (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we're having breakthroughs and oh yeah hugs, hugs with our little girls our inner child tell me one uh, of your biggest breakthroughs one ever of my biggest life ever in my life oh man probably leaving my ex-husband mm. if i if i stayed in that relationship I probably would not be alive right now Um, most of it was uh, mental abuse I mean there wasn't a lot of he threw a chair at me once I think I told you this before he threw a chair at me once across the room missed me hit the wall put holes in the wall from the legs and he thought I wasn't throwing it at you (laughs) I I never I to this day I know he was throwing it at me but that was the only like physical he'd punch walls punch a steering wheel um so anyway I didn't mean to get into the history of it but the day I was like if I don't leave now I'm not going to live Mm -hmm. whether it be self-inflicted death or you know my husband just 
blowing up one day and hurting me. I don't know. I lived in fear for a long time. So it's like even though the the physical abuse wasn't there, the fear of the physical abuse was there 24-7. So the day that I said get out of my life, well, I told him I wanted to separate. And I knew the whole time that I wanted a divorce. I wanted to get him out of my life. But um, he was one of those people that would threaten, if you ever leave me, I'll kill myself. If you ever leave me, I'll cut my arms, you know, that kind of thing. So I stayed for a long time Mm -hmm. to save him, which was so stupid. Like, I look back now, it was so stupid. But um, so the day I was like, we're going to separate. And I sat there for an hour while he begged me not to leave. And I stood my ground. And from that time on, I've been like way stronger than I've ever been in my life. So I guess that would be a a breakthrough. (laughs) That is. Yeah. Grandmother of breakthrough. See, now I want to go give myself a hug. (laughs) Yeah. I was, I was. 23 I was so young so like the that was the time in my life when KD disappeared for a while you know stop I'm not crying you're crying it's okay I got her back oh wow yeah yeah that's amazing the choice point that gives us our freedom from those kinds of prisons, right? Wow. And it ranges. Those kinds of prisons range. I mean, there's, there's that. And what I try to find for people in their fitness is, like it might not be an abusive relationship like that with somebody else. They might be in a perfectly healthy relationship, but they don't realize that something that they've carried, that their parents said to them when they were younger that is a mentally abusive thing to carry Mm -hmm. and like actually keeps them in a state of a different state of fear, right? Like they're in a state they'll never be loved by that person that they really need the love from. And so then everything day to day, how they eat, how they work out all relates to trying to achieve that kind of love. And when they choose to break off, from that relationship to separate from that mental abuse they're free and they're more empowered Mm -hmm. Um, so there's different levels of that kind of breakthrough and it's funny because i know i'm a personal trainer professionally i know i have certifications and all in coaching i know i have a license as a spiritual counselor but what i really feel like i'm doing is i'm helping people become more free like like liberating people from what is keeping them captive in their body. Yeah. And I'm really like, I feel more like an investigator. Hmm. I feel yeah. like I'm actually an investigator because when you hire me, I will investigate where the blocks or where the abuse is. Yeah. You're and ferociously I'm... curious. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it's only for the purpose of helping people experience what you felt when you left. That kind of power, right? The kind of reclamation of your freedom to not have to be under the burden of all of that fear. Yeah. And And what I want to say right now, am I interrupting? Did I interrupt you? No. Sorry. (laughs) I, I just, I wanted to say right now that this, is the beast I am talking about letting the beautiful beast out letting that beast free so this podcast is called unveiling the beast ladies and gentlemen that's the beast I'm talking about oh Oh my gosh I love it oh I think I just peed a little Well, I think that that's a good place to end it. I really do. But I have, um, I have one question that I ask every single person at mm-hmm. the end of each 
each episode, and that is if there was one piece of advice that you could give to the world, what would it be? Smile, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Just smile, the like, and fake yeah. until you make it. Smile until you feel that joy inside of you. Yeah, that's my advice. Just smile and keep smiling until you feel that joy radiating throughout your body. And then do the dolphin dance. <laughs> I love it. Ladies and gentlemen, Coach Elena Margarita Williams signing off. Until next time. Bye.